as I am now. In progress. Okay. Now, if you can't hear me, open a chat session. You should be able to. I haven't done any setting changes. So tonight, what are we going to go over? We will be going over the following. This is from chapters one and two out of test out. And chapter three, if you've noticed, is nothing more than a review of chapter one and two with lots of questions. So we'll be talking about grip, uh, stat, move, copy, hard links and soft links. So you'll understand what they mean by actually doing them. And we'll look at the command called stat and then grep. Okay, those are, and then SSH, I will show you that too also. So let's start with stuff that's outside the box. And we will go here. If you go to um, freeshell.org, Okay, it's superdomainfortress.org. This is the name of a public access free, technically, system. This is on NetBSD. I brought it up last week, I think, to show you what it's about, okay, and how to access it. By the end of this evening, you'll know how to access this box from the command line just like accessing the Jeremy box from the command line. And the SSH client that we'll be learning how to use will work on Windows or Mac or Linux. Caveat emptor, can't use X Windows on, on Microsoft Windows. Okay, we'll talk about that. So what do you get when you get here? Well, you get a lot of fun little things but it's free and what they do is they give you kind of a limited shell account that gives you the ability to do certain things. And I believe if you want the advanced version, it's $36 per year. And it gives you the ability to host your own domain name. You have an email address. Uh, you can put a one of their 50 domains on your email address. So I'll show you how to use this later on in the semester um, because as an instructor, if you tell me when, what your account is, I can say you get that free $36 a year version for the duration of the class. So you can play with it and tinker with it, okay? And oh, we're done with census. So go ahead and just initial now. And we just take today's date, which is the 30th. And you just initial it and scribble away. And that's what we'll pass around um, on during our classes. Okay, so what does this look like and how does it work? Well, if you spend some time looking at this, you can learn some things just by the website. How many have heard of a 501c7? The most common is 501c3. That's your church. You can make a donation to a nonprofit and it becomes tax deductible. This is not that. This is like belonging to a health club where you pay a membership fee to be part of the health club. It is not a tax write off. And it helps, you know, the fees help pay for disc and, you know, bandwidth and other such things. They also have the ability to support dial-up. So if you have a family member who's way out in the boonies and only has dial-up, you can get them on the internet. So they do have a pop, as they call it. But this goes back to the days of fun bulletin board systems. 
that's when this was started back in the dark ages okay all right so now tonight we'll be using jupiter lab and the terminal okay so what i want to do tonight is play around with this just a little bit to give you an idea of what this is. In your bin directory, you notice you have this script that is set up for you. It's called back up my stuff. What is that script? Okay, well, how do you look at the contents of a file? Yeah, cat, my stuff. Remember, I only needed enough to make it unique. And then you hit the tab key so you don't have to type it in. Windows does this too. So this is what it's doing. So basically what this does is it's backing up everything in your home directory into a directory called backups. So at the end of the semester, all your stuff can be backed up to a zip file and you can download it to your Windows box. You won't be able to do much with it because it'll be all Linux, but at least you can save your bash RC and your history file and all that stuff. So if you do get a Linux box, you can put it on a Linux box, okay? I'll show you how to do that if you want to, okay? But basically, you'll get an email from me. Hey, I'm gonna rebuild the box, run that script and back your stuff up if you are so inclined. A lot of people don't care and it just vaporizes, okay? And it gets toasted, okay? And everybody has a slightly different bin directory. Okay. Now, I am on Tux, correct? All right? Everybody understands that? Okay. On Tux, I can use something called SSH and go somewhere else on the planet. And this won't work for you. It'll work for me. I think it's one. This is taking me to the Super Domain Fortress website. Okay. And put in yes. Thank you, sir. And password. <laughs> but um, if I can remember ancient history, anybody have a clue what this is running on? We mentioned it in class once. Isn't it hard? to remember all this crazy, crazy detail. I get it. I totally do. SSH. Pardon? Is it SSH? Uh, it, the operating system. Oh. So we use uname minus A. And what is the operating system? That BSD. That BSD. Ding, ding, ding. The lights of recognition go off. Now, what you have just been exposed to is something called familiarity. Familiarity is enough to get around if you kind of know how to get started. But to get at the top of your field, you need something called mastery. And mastery is when I say, how do you look at the contents inside of a file? You immediately say cat. So there, you can tell there's a difference in, in the levels of your learning. And in the 290 class, we're going to be talking about craftsmanship and what it takes to become really good at something. And that's when you get happy at your work. Okay. So here it is. And it has a website. It's called HTML. And let's take a look at it. So what does it look like? Pretty basic web page. You have reached the very last page on the internet, go and plug and play. All right. The fellow that did that 
10 or 15 years ago, did it as a joke and he couldn't believe how many people actually found the last page on the internet. <laughs> so he kept it up for a long time. All right, so this is there. So now how do we get to that website? Well, let's open a browser and they are using the Apache web server on NetBSD. It's configured the same on NetBSD as it is on Linux. Their configurations are far more robust and more correct than what I've got on the Jeremy box. For example, uh, SDF1. Notice how it's using the username that I log in with as the first part of the domain name. Okay, that's called virtual hosts. I could do it, but I don't because I wanna keep the configuration simple. So when we go through Apache, you'll get an idea of what the configurations are without getting overwhelmed because it's easy to do, okay? And then I just have some other stuff there, like the learning log, which I haven't touched in ages. And basically this is our, what? Static website generator, ad nauseum, okay? So we used SSH to get to the web server. We changed an HTML file and we can delete and display the HTML file. We did the same thing on the Jeremy box, correct? But we had some issues with Zachary's account. We had a lot of fun trying to get that figured out. Did it ever work? Yes. yes. So it was something with... I was timing it wrong, I guess. Yeah, it, it just started working. Yeah. Yep, magic. After the Chrome update, who knows? Okay. All right. So let's go back to the screen here. Now, on our uh, lab here, I want to display an environment variable called display. How do we do that? How did we echo our path? Yeah. How do we do the display? Add dollar display, exactly. Now, what you notice is it's blank. The convention for environment variables are uppercase. It does not have to be that way, but that is the convention. Okay. Now, I am going to go to this machine right here. I did control alt T open to term. How do I echo display? And I get a number, don't I? Everybody open a terminal on your box. Guest is fine. For what we're doing here, this is fine. On the Jeremy box in front of you, just log in as guest, type in echo dollar display. You should see that. Then type in X E Y E S and hit enter. And what do you get? Little eyeballs. Isn't that cool? It's enough to drive your, your grandkids crazy. It's really fun when you do this. I am going to put it into the background by using the ampersand. One, two, three, four, five. And guess what? Now they're singing. La, la, la. The grandkids love this. Of course, they fill the whole screen up, you know. And, <laughs> and you know, they, so, and then to get out of it, all you do is you just close the X eyes. Go back to the Jeremy box, type in X eyes. And what happens? 
It's because the Jeremy box with the Jupiter notebook has a terminal emulator that has no X windows capability, which means no display. This is what you're gonna get when you try to do this from a Windows SSH command line. On a Mac, it'll work like this. So on a Mac, you type in Xize, it'll work, okay? As long as you log into the Jeremy box first. You have to log in, we're getting there next, okay? <laughs> Now that you're open and you got the guest account in front of you, let's log in to the Jeremy account in the back room. So you will type in JM, oops, SSH minus Y. Y is important. I'll talk about that in just a second. Your username, which is your first name and your digits, right? At jmkll.org. And I'm going to use Tux this time. Put in the password. Now notice my prop doesn't change very much, does it? It's the same color, but the host name is different. Oh, come on. Can you see what happened? Kind of, sort of, maybe not quite. I was on this box. I typed in SSH minus upcase Y, my user account on the Jeremy box in the back room. I get a password and I log in. It still says Tux, but it says lab. It doesn't say JMKLL31Con. Post name. That's where I am. Host name. Okay. So this will bite you once in your career, maybe twice. But if it happens too often, you're going to be changing jobs. Hey, I need to delete a bunch of directories and I'm on the wrong machine. Uh-oh. Trust me, you won't do that very often. So this is why I put the name of the machine in the prompt. Because <laughs> I've done that mistake. Okay. One time it actually cost, cost three days of consulting time. That's when I was just getting started in Unix. And I was like, oops. That's where I learned the hard way between dot and dot dot. So I was I did the command right, but I was at the wrong command level, wrong directory level. So it's like nuts. Okay. So now that I'm logged in, I'm on the Jeremy box, right? And I use the dash Y. How do I display the contents of my display? The environment variable. Yep, yeah, we're gonna display the, I wanna get, I wanna see if I have a X windows capability. Yeah. So what happens when I type in X size on the Jeremy box connected to the Jeremy box from a Linux box that supports X windows. The whole X windows world right now is they're moving from X windows to something called Wayland and the Wayland subsystem. There's a lot of things you can't do in it yet, um, but they're rolling it out to production on a lot of um, notebook type applications so they can get the bugs figured out. You don't run X windows on a big server. Okay. It's just, it uses too much juice. 
but I'm running it on the Jeremy box for demos. Okay. It's not just for simple little things like sex size. If you have the bandwidth and you have the time, you can do things like this. Oops, I don't have it installed there. Let's do this. Oh dear. How about, let's do snap list. What do I got installed? Not a whole lot. All right, let's do it this way. Or manager. There's some X Windows stuff. That's on the Jeremy box. It's running on the Jeremy box, but the display is being exported to me by way of SSH minus Y. Otherwise, it won't work. Let me show you. If I type in exit and take out the dash Y, log in. Oh, never mind. It's going to work because I'm using my SSH config. I will show you this later in the semester. Um, config, it's there. Oh, wrong machine. I'll show you how to use this later in the semester, okay? But see, one of the things it does automatically does X windows, whether or not I put in the dash Y. This SSH config is full of dark arts. Okay. You can bypass VPN. You can create tunnels. You can have all kinds of fun, but it's a long read and it takes some time to learn how to use it. We will just barely scratch the surface of what it can do my job is to let you know it's there, okay? And I'll show you some simple configs and we'll go from there, okay? All right, so I'm back on this box. Now I'm gonna go back out to the Jeremy box. And didn't we decide we were going to create a new directory and add it to our search path? Did we do that? We got pretty close to that. We didn't quite get there. So let's make sure we have an in-class directory. And let's do some review. Now, you can do this either from the terminal in the Jupyter Notebook or the SSH. I like SSH because it's faster. Okay. So I now have another directory. And how do I add that to my path statement? Where do I do that? Remember all the fun we had with VI and the dot bash RC file? Yeah, everybody needs to load up a Linux box. <laughs> Get one running at home. I am covering a lot of stuff really fast. Okay. Notice I don't have a path statement. This we got to at the very, very end. I think it was right after class was out. And then we'll put
Yeah, I'll put that in there. Now, I'll show you this one, that little dot. We kind of covered that a little bit. When the dot is in your path, you do not need dot slash to run an executable, but that's not normal. This is normal, okay? And if you wanna be technically correct, we need sync double quotes around it. Where, where are you right now? Are you in uh, bash RC, bash RC. Bash RC. dot bash RC okay. on my login to the Jeremy box, not guest. So I've SSH'd into the back room, and your username should say username digits. Okay. And that's the line you want. I'll show you. Oops. Let's do this. Echo dollar path. The four. After. You see a difference? Now I'll slow down and go over that again. Step one, we create a new directory in our home directory on the Jeremy box called in class. We do an LS, we see in class. We wanna make in class part of our path statement. To do that, we need to edit the .bashrc file. And we add the following line. Now, let me tell you what's happening here. Remember when we did the shell level thing and we went down and our environment variable disappeared and then it came back and so on and so forth? Export says modify the path and make it available to all of your subshells. Okay, all of them. Take the existing path and append to it my home directory slash bin and my home directory slash in class. So this is where you, you can use your DI editor. Okay. And VI is worth your time, at least to watch some videos. Okay. There's a bunch of them out there. I think two hours hands-on during the week is not enough time. <laughs> How would you like a four-hour class with this? <laughs> You'd all fall asleep. It's definitely better with hands-on. Once you have it in your bash RC like this, all everybody there yet? Not there yet? Where's your dot bash RC file? It's in your home directory. How do you find your home directory? You just type in CD and that puts you in home.
We got it? Sort of? Close? Need a little refresher on VI? Nobody's fessing up. That means the answer is yes. So, a refresher on VI. VI junk. I want to insert, I use the letter I, and then I start typing. And then if I type in or hit the button escape, it takes it out of insert mode and it turns it into command mode where I can do things like YY, which means yank, and then paste. And then if I want to change a word in command mode, I can do CW and say that. To save and exit, I hit escape, colon, WQ, and there's my file. There's two ways to save and close. Let's change this one. This is this is this and that. So another way to save and close is shift. You have to be, you just hit escape, shift ZZ. That's another way to save and exit. However, if you're working in production, be careful. Uh, oftentimes you will save something and you deleted something you didn't want to and you can't get it back. <laughs> so double check because shift -Z, Z is really fast and sometimes you get sloppy and you save things you shouldn't, okay? So now if I cat my file, there it is. So vi.bashrc, making sure I am in my home directory. I want to go to the end of the file. I just hit uppercase G. It goes to the last line. And then you just add this line by doing letter I, type it in. And when you're done, you hit escape. Shift ZZ. Do we have success so far? We've got some good successes? Not yet? Did anything break yet? Yes. Yeah, okay, we get to fix it. How fun. Um, so I'm able to SSH into um, my account. It's good. But I broke my, um, the, my Jeremy box. Oh, okay. So, ah, uh, okay. We'll take a look. We'll see what, oh, okay. All right, we'll see what we can come up with here. We'll see if we can fix it. All right. So once this is saved, we exit, and I need to have my bash file, dot bash rc, Reread into my current working memory. And the buzzword for that is called source. And there's two ways to do it. You type out the word source. And it will display and it basically rereads it. Now, in your case, yeah. if you do that, do you get an error? No, but that's how I broke it. Okay. And now try echo. Dollar path. And you should see you're in class. Now mine's duplicated because I've sourced mine more than once. Okay. If I do it again, I'll get it again. Okay. And you'll find in Windows, when you set a path statement in Windows, you can look at it and you'll, it'll be set 15 times. They don't seem to care as long as it's set. Like if you install Java, it will sit there and install 15 different environment variables, but they're all the same environment variable. So I don't know how that happens or why, but it does. It's Windows. Okay. 
Now we're ready to play, but we have to fix something first, right? So let's use the Occam Razor. How are you heard of it? Bummer. This is important. Occam Razor is a rule of thumb that given two likely answers to a problem, the simplest is more correct. Not always right, but generally it is. So you have a problem on your PC. Is it your PC or not? So let's cut it in half and open the Jeremy box on the machine in front of you. This will say it's your PC or not. Troubleshooting is one of the toughest things to teach. And I have yet to find a good way to do it. Does it work or not? HTTPS jmk.org. Everybody behind you is looking at your computer. Can you feel the pressure? <laughs> and you're making all kinds of typos right now. Totally get it. <laughs> Uh huh. Okay. Now, if it's your computer, how do we diagnose what? What would be an appropriate thing at this point? Turn it off and turn it back on again. That's always an option with Windows. Mm -hmm. Always, always. I would open another browser and see if the other browser has the same exact problem. If it has the same exact problem, that means it's lower than in the operating system hierarchy than the browser. If there, if it works with one browser and not the other, that says there's a problem with the browser, kind of like we discovered with Zachary. Can you see how that troubleshooting kind of works? Yeah, it's common sense, but you'll find it, you'll be working with people that have no clue what common sense is, okay? Let's- No, oh, it works on a different browser, it works on Edge. It works on a different browser. Worked in a different browser. Interesting. Now comes the fun part. How do you fix it? That's where you've got to go into your, let's see here, Chrome or whatever you're in. And there's this thing down here called more tools, developer tools, and this console. There is a ton of stuff in here. The web browser is the best way to think of it is a miniature operating system. It has got a tremendous amount of flexibility and complexity, all to track your next ad. Because the telemetry data gets all sent back to the mothership. Uh, browser. what was it? Closing the browser and opening the browser back up fixed it. Fixed it. So that means there maybe something like a cookie or something was corrupted or something in the temp file. So the, uh, the equivalent of reboot work. <laughs> so now that we have our in class directory in our path, let's revisit something. Get to use VI again. Remember how to write a hello world in bash? Let's do it. I'll just call it hello world.sh. It doesn't need the sh, but who cares? She bang bin bash. Hello world sh. And I'll say, this time I'm going to add a for loop just for fun. I 
I think this will work. I may have to do some troubleshooting. Hmm. No, let's do it this way. I'll do it the way this. Uh, This is a little cleaner, I think. Do not need this last one. The hashtag minus minus. It's just a habit I got on two years ago. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a list of items and I'm putting it into the variable called LST. Notice that when you declare a variable, there's no dollar sign in front of it. This is unusual as JavaScript you have a dollar sign. And Python, you can use the dollar sign or not. And other languages, same thing. In Bash, when you declare a variable, you do not use the dollar sign. But when you use the variable, that says, display the contents of what's in the box. Okay. So let's run this. Now, what happened? Look at the code. So it's breaking on spaces. Wherever there's a space, that gets put into list. So what I can also do is say, to see what's in it, OK? That will just display the entire list. I'll run that once. There it is. So what is this for loop doing? Well, it starts with four and I give it a variable. This is my counter. That's all it is, it's a counter. In the variable list, and then it says do, do done is how you start, stop loops in back. Okay. No squirrely brackets, no indents. And then echo dollar X. So it's telling me what is in each thing. As you saw it display. What happens when we do this? Echo dollar in. What happened? The first one is the contents of the entire LST variable. The second one is the results of the for loop. And the for loop breaks on a space and it prints it with minus n. Minus n says, do not put one of those in there. That's a carriage return. Do not, no line feed is another way to look at it. Okay. That's what dash n does. Now, let's have some fun with this. Comment up. Now, this is the read statement. 
This is the input output. This is the way you get stuff from a keyboard. Okay. So I will put a message to the user. Magic. So what's happening? Well, the minus N suppresses the carriage return. So the prompt says, enter a few numbers separated by space. And the user puts the numbers in right after the angle bracket. And, you, and then as soon as they hit enter, it closes the variable name LST. So I put one, two, three, four in there and hit enter. And then what did it print? One, two, three, four with the carriage returns. I'll do it again. Except this time, I'm going to put in some words. Spaces, that's all I've done. Bash has no concept of integers and strings in characters. That's a big gotcha. Okay. You have to verify <laughs> how you do things like that. Okay. Other programming languages you can explicitly set integer, float, real. Okay. Bash is doesn't. Okay. Now, how do I make my HWSH executable? Now I know that's in test out. You better start working on test out. Because the way it works is the beginning chapters are fairly easy, but it gets a lot harder really quick towards the end. So if you don't have a consistent pattern of working on it, you will not be able to cram and get it all done at the end of the semester. It's impossible. There's just too much to do. There's a thousand some odd questions spread out throughout the semester. You're going to try to do that in two days? Yeah, it ain't going to happen. You cannot cram for computer science any more than you can cram for shooting three pointers. Okay. It takes a little bit every day. All right. Remember? Not. Here we go. CH mod. Plus sign X for executable HWSH. Remember what that did? If we did an LS minus L and the things with the permissions and the read, write, execute. Ah, now it's clicking. Yeah, that's all stuff we've done before. And if you wait between classes to tinker with this, you are going to forget it. One hour a week is not enough, <laughs> or two hours a week is not enough. Okay. You have access to the Jeremy box, use it. Go over your notes, look in test out, take some of the stuff you see in test out, poke on it. My favorite interview question is, 
what book are you currently reading? And if they said, oh, I'm reading about the Microsoft DNS server. Or, yes, you're going to get the second interview. If they said, no, I don't do anything with tech after I get out of off my job, then they won't get the second interview. <laughs> it, it fosters and it tab products. We always hire people that were hobbyists as well as professional IT people because the hobbyists bring a lot to the table. Hey, have you tried this or that? No, let's go see how it works. Solved a lot of problems. All right. Now, I'm just going to type in HWSH. Will it work or will it not? Notice where my directory is. Let's do that for PWD. I did CD, so I'm back in my home directory. PWD shows me I'm in my home directory. And if I type in hw.sh, will it or will it not work? How many say yeah? Yeah. How many say no? Okay, here we go. The reason it works for me is it's in my path statement. Can you see in class? Now, if I have another directory, let's call it backups. Let's just copy. This is something that you'll need to know how to do anyway. I'm going to say in class hw.sh. I want to go up. No, I want to go to backups. And I'll call it the same thing. No, I should rename it. Let's do that. Give it a different name. It's there. I'll call it HW2. All right. <laughs> now, if I type in HW2, 2.sh Why? Oh, it's a uh, backups not in my path. Same it's not in my path. Backups is not on my path. Now, how do I make it run? There's two ways or more than two. Three off the top of my head. We can do this. I'm making your ears melt. Okay. We can type in bash HWSH. We can type in dot slash. That will work. We can use source. And then we can use the dot. Because remember, source and dot are a, um, they're an alias, okay? I find it easier to use the word source because when you're looking at a screen all day, looking at a little dot, you sometimes miss it, okay? So I can get it to work from my current working directory if I proceed it with source or dot slash or bash, providing it's executable, okay? And it is because, see it there, All right? Now let's have some fun here. I am going to touch on this because it's in your chapter on chapter two, it is called uh, 
Create a hard link and create a symbolic link. 2.10 and 2. Point, well, 2.10.4 and 2.10.5. We're going to walk through that in our last few minutes of class here. And I'll explain what they are. Okay. So here's h2.sh. The command for hard links and soft links is the same command with a different flag, and it's called ln. So if I create a hard link, I do hw2, and I'll say hw3. I do an ll, and notice I have a brand new file called hw3. It's the same size. Now, let's do this ls minus li. See that big old long number in the front? That's an inode. They're the same, aren't they? So what this is telling you is you have one inode on disk, which points to a file. But it's the same file with a different name. This is where we can use that command called stat, okay? That's got, a, that's got all kinds of stuff to it. In Windows, you can see when a file was created. And that's about it. In Linux, you can see when it was created and when it was last accessed and when it was last modified. So that's a very interesting Thing to know if you get into forensics. Here's a file. When was it created? When was it accessed last? Okay, this is the password file. This is the last one accessed. Ha, ah, this might be the more, most accurate password file. Okay. And then birth tells you when it was created, of course. Okay. And they're all pretty close to each other um, because that's what we've done. Now, if I cat HW3 and then HW2, is there any difference? No, they are the same. Watch what happens when I edit the HW3. Enter something. So if I cat HW3, do my long listing, they're still the same exact size. Do you think they're the same inodes? Yes. Same inodes. Now, if I cat HW2, will it be the original file? This is called a hard link. Same inode, different file names, same contents. So I can delete one of them. So you can see it's gone, but it's still gonna work. That is a hard link. Now, I'm going to use a symbolic link to connect another file called HW4. And it's LN, LN minus S. You want the real one to the new one.
What are you seeing? Are the inodes the same? No. No. You see something in the very beginning of the read write. It's called L. That L is telling you that that file is a symbolic link. So I can cat HW4 Same thing. If I edit HW4, enter something with a space. Cat HW4, cat HW3. A symbolic link is bigger or smaller than the original file. Really small. How many remember libraries when they used to have little cards in them and you'd pull the cards out and you'd pull out a card and find your book? Does somebody, how many have seen those? Okay, a couple of you seen them, but probably a lot of you don't even know what they are. In essence, what this is saying is, I've got two pointers to the same file. So I can delete HW4 and HW3 is going to be just fine. But what happens when I delete HW3? I have a symbolic link. I have a pointer to a file that does not exist. And symbolic links are used all over in the Linux subsystem because that's the only way you can get the same file name across two disks. So I have a disk splitting over in New York and a disk spinning in Monterey. I can give it a symbolic link and it will be the same exact file, even though they're geographically dispersed. Okay. Windows has only recently started supporting that. And of course they call it something else. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a very effective way to manage disk. Okay. So I can't do anything with that because the link is broken. So if I try to cat it, sorry, sorry, even though it tells me something's there, it's because it's nothing is point is nothing connected on the other end. So do an RM on HW4. Okay. How can I make this class so you guys don't want to fall asleep on me? I go too fast? Should I give you an exercise when we walk in? Oh, that's what I'll do. That's a great idea. I'll give you a blank piece of paper with a few instructions on it. And you're only going to have to use something called your memory. I think of this. No, not in this syllabus. I used to call PPA assignments. Professor prerogative assignment. Assigned at random. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll be gentle. Use it as a learning opportunity to see if I'm actually getting across some of this content. There's, in the beginning, the world of Linux looks like this. It's very scary. The learning curve is like this. Very, very steep in the beginning. Windows, anybody can be, look like they know what they're doing until it gets to the point where not even Microsoft can help you. That happened to me twice and almost lost my job twice because of the screw ups Microsoft did. But Foster didn't know that. It was just my fault. I was the IT guy, right? So I prefer to have a steep learning curve because you're not making money here. This is where you're really making money in Windows or you're looking for another job. 
Who wants to live with that kind of pressure? But once you spend some time with Linux, it doesn't take as long as you think it would, especially if you tinker with it. You can get pretty good pretty fast. And there's a lot of things you can just figure out once you kind of figure out how everything bolted together. Okay. On that note, I'll stop my yammering. And let's see here. And I'll turn off the recording. Yeah. <laughs>